welcome to Literally Literary. My name is Vanessa, and today I have with me Jorge Gomez and Bertie Marufo, and we will be discussing Poet X. Literally Literary is a podcast brought to you by the Mellon Foundation. And um, as part of the Mellon Foundation, Vanessa is um, the, a, a student fellow, and so I'm uh, Jorge Gomez, and I'm a faculty fellow. Um, and uh, I teach English at um, El Paso Community College right here in the border. Um, and I'll let my uh, colleague and good friend uh, introduce himself. And uh, my name is Richie Butterfly. I'm a regular fellow, but not of the of this organization. It's just uh, some guy you can find on the street. I, I teach English as well. And kind of fitting into the themes of the book, um, I am completely immersed in here in El Paso, the spoken word poetry scene, open mic scene, and and uh, teaching writing workshops to people of all ages, including youth. So a lot of stuff really resonated. I'm happy to be here, and I want to thank you for the invitation. I'm also, of course, helping run and edit the sound for today. So, Vanessa, what's up? Wow, thank you so much. Yes. We really appreciate you lending out your studio to us and, and you know, joining the conversation and... and um, um, you know, for a book that's getting a lot of attention and that we ourselves are going to give away as part of um, Hispanic Heritage uh, Thursday to the best spoken word uh, artists. We definitely have to put that out there to the world. Are you going to read from it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm going to there for a minute. You're, you're already, you, you, so since this is uh, not a visual podcast, only out of, like your your eyes gleamed with with like I'm gonna win this, you know. This is mine. Much with uh, <laughs> the hope and ambition that our, our our character has when she discovers the word and, and what it can do for her. Yeah, and and um, Vanessa, you, you how did you want to um, start off like uh, with you know. Can, can you give the the listener like a broad o- overview and of the the plot and um, you know we could also go into the um, the fact that it's 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 a novel in verse right that's one of the big things yeah. and maybe the characters I could say while you're kind of doing it I could say a little bit real quick about Elizabeth herself yeah um, so as many of you who are listening and probably already know she's won a ton of awards for this book and. Herself is the first winner of the Carnegie Medal in its 83-year history, which um, first a woman, first person of color, and I think that in itself is a very important uh, milestone. Um, reminds me a lot of uh, Ben Sines, her own writing, but also that you know he was the first winner of the Penn Faulkner Award, and I think it's important to sit that those presidents, and also to point out that when it comes to uh, literature. Um, Things are not where they're supposed to be when it comes to diversity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, in 2019, it's it's, it's uh, we're getting there. But um, also, I, 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 I kind of want to know when we say Elizabeth, we're talking about Elizabeth Acevedo. I don't think we even said her full name yet. Oh, sorry. we haven't. No, yeah. we haven't. Yeah. So I feel like I just committed a mortal sin. <laughs> Come on, what do we tell our students? <laughs> no. her, her mom is going to get mad at me, but uh, the mom in the book. But right, right. Um, and, and I, we ultimately are, well, our dream as part of the, the Mountain Fellowship is to maybe find a way to bring her here to the border. Mm-hmm. And I think from what I remember, when, when, I, when she was signing the book, I asked her if she has ever been here and she said no and, you know, that she'd be open to it. And, you know, so that, that's kind of a larger long term goal that we have here. So. This will be put online. So, uh, Elizabeth, if you're listening, we would love to have you visit the border. I'll show you a oh, great time. Goodness. Yes, please come visit us. We'll have a, a special poetry slam. Yeah. And maybe it's part of the, the, the Texas Book Festival, which, mm-hmm. we, you know, they might choose us as like the host city. But awesome. Yeah. All good things possibly to come. So, yeah, for maybe a listener who's not familiar with the book, um, I think an, an overview. What, what can people come to expect? Uh, picking this book up from a, a bookstore or library? I think it's a really good read. Um, you get to see Siomara and her journey through high school, not her entire not her entire high school experience, but about a year's worth of her life. Um, and you get to see all the different people that she comes in contact with and her relationships with them. Um 
it is set in Harlem, and um, so you do see a lot of that city in her story and the trains that she's riding. And, 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 and from the very beginning, right, that, that first very first poem, uh, Stoop Sitting, uh, one of the things that struck me about that, and I know that um, to the listener, we want to go over specific poems in the subsequent episodes, but just yeah. as a background to the setting, you know, the, the really paints a good picture of, of Harlem, right, and this idea of, of sitting on the stoop. Yes, which is, uh, which is kind of embodied as this kind of typical kind of New York thing, the stoop. Yeah. And, and uh, something I noted on, like I said, I know we're going to get deeper into this, yeah, but yeah. I think it's the perfect intro because it, it kind of juxtaposes her mm-hmm. as, as kind of in, in the city. And mm-hmm. I kind of mark the city's soundscape, like all the noise and sounds you hear. Yeah. And if you've ever been to New York City or, or Harlem or the Bronx. I know you've been there. Right? Right? Yeah, and yeah. it's it's oh man, it's it's just filled with life. I, I yeah. love you know like the way it describes right right away it pulls you in. Yeah, I think yeah. a great any great book will do that. You know, in literature we always talk about the great first lines. Mm-hmm. Here's a great first poem of a book yes. that that really draws you in, fish hook style, and, mm-hmm. and it doesn't stop. Right? It really doesn't, and neither does the audiobook. And and, and we'll talk more about that the next episode. Right on. Yeah. What about the um, overall plot? Like, what would you say um, is Siomara's story? Siomara is trying to essentially figure out who she is as a person, and she's also trying to do that through her own writing. And so she keeps a journal, and that's essentially what you're reading is poems that she's written for her journal, for herself, to kind of discover who she is. Um, She writes about... Her interactions with her mom, with her twin brother. Um, she writes about this boy that she has a crush on. Mm-hmm. She writes about her religion and her questioning of her religion as well. Um, you also see her dealing with her best friend, Caridad. And so you get to see all of these different relationships and how she interacts with these people and kind of how that shapes who she is as a person as well as her writing does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there's also a uh, F- father, Sean, who is an interesting character in terms of his arc. Yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah, I, I related a lot to the, to the book from the religious perspective yeah. and, you know, growing up Catholic and, um, you know, so I, I thought he was very well mm-hmm. depicted. Um, and then there's also uh, Miss Galliano, uh, the who acts as the, you know this kind of literacy sponsor, right? Like, and it's kind of like some, I don't know. She's kind of like a dream teacher to me. You know, I want to say so for the uninitiated. How would you kind of define a, a literary sponsor? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so in, in my class, I define it as someone who pushes you to get educated, pushes you to pursue your dreams, mm-hmm. and I also think there's unliteracy sponsors who can also be teachers by the way unfortunately actually, yeah so uh, there's a lot of those cases and, and but you know miss canada is is completely um you know um, aware of and cognizant of Siomara's talents mm-hmm. and wants to find the right place and the right space uh for them to cultivate themselves which is very reminiscent of um with the fire on high, which I can, if I can just quickly plug that book, like just as amazing and, and also highly recommend it. Mm-hmm. Right on. Yeah. Uh, so to, to kind of just, my overview of the book, I absolutely, like I said, um, something I fell in love with was the poetry, you know, and, and the, and the, and the format it was presented in, then that you're, you're reading these, these kind of free verse poems. And yeah. it's, I think it's a format that in, in today's age, I think is in a, in a way kind of easier for some people to read. Hmm. Um, I think I think people do a better job of digesting information in smaller bits, in part due to the way in which we receive information through, say, social media and technology. So I think that's something that um, resonates a little, you know, these little yeah. segments. And I think it's easier to kind of move the thread along. <clears throat> but to a larger degree, you know, um, what we're looking at, a lot of these tropes we see early on are, are kind of indicative of any coming-of-age novel. And, and in particular, and, and, and when we study literature, what we call a Kunstler Roman, right? Uh, which is the the coming of age novel for an artist, right? The artist novel, and, and that's her, you know, finding her identity, as you said, you know, all these characters that are part of her life and how they influence her development, um, whether it be in, in support 
or in rejection, but ultimately it's it's her finding her voice. So I'm I'm really curious to see you know how you are able to identify with these these elements. Like, uh, the, well, maybe this. Like, I was thinking what you said of the style and and the um, you know reverse, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it is kind of interesting because um, when I don't know about you, but whenever I teach poetry, you know, that's what students struggle with most. And yet this is highly accessible, even though it's blending, you know, these genres. Um, and so in that sense, you know, it's postmodern, right? Yes. And, and it's kind of ironic because we kind of associate postmodernism with, with like very, you know, very dense, like you know, th- different point of views, uh, stream of consciousness, et cetera, right? Like sure. the meta-ness of it. Right. Uh, and yet this is one of the, the like I had mentioned, on, well, maybe I didn't mention it, but uh, her language reminds me a lot of, of Ben Sines, who is one of my favorite writers and also here from El Paso, um, in terms of her precision. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I think that's part of the accessibility of it. Um, it, it, poem to poem is also, uh, you know, very admirable how they just flow very well together, you know, and I don't know, as, as a an amateur poet myself, I just think that's, that's very, um, you know, very, very much speaks to, um, uh, Elizabeth's own background as, as, mm-hmm. you know, someone who was also uh, a spoken word artist. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. So <clears throat> maybe we can even step outside of, of, the, of the book itself for a moment and, and talk about Elizabeth Acevedo. She is a renowned spoken word poet. And, and of course, I think one thing that I don't think we've noted yet is that she was, you know, because of this, was able to kind of narrate her own the audio book of this. And I think that's pretty fun. So if you guys haven't had a chance to, to read it, you know, even look up the audio book. Listen to it on, you know, on your drives. Yes, yeah. it's very good. And she wrote it in a way that it just flows so perfectly when she's reading it. And it's, Mm -hmm. she did a really great job, I think. Yeah. I I think it's a real treat too, um, because she has that background. Because unfortunately, even though like there's really great authors and writers, um, well, you know, unfortunately, sometimes they're not the best readers of their work. But that makes sense. Um, and I guess in the sense of uh, <clears throat> sometimes it can be dr- kind of dry and just I mean the words are what they are they're great and but so I've I've seen some pretty dry readings from great authors and so to kind of have this this background herself I think lends this this kind of spirit this this kind of nature of what the book's about anyway like um, and I think that's great because. We're not, you know, not really diving into it yet either, because I imagine we'll touch on that later on. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the kind of poetry that <clears throat> Siomara is going into here is is, is a performance poetry, mm-hmm. which is kind of the the blending of not just the written word but spoken word and, and very th- and theater, right? Um, being able to, uh, she kind of talks about, she kind of comes to terms with her own body too, mm-hmm. and, and kind of filling up and letting her words. Um, be manifested through movement and, and, and space. So I think that's that's kind of uh, tantamount, tantamount to understanding the book as well. So it's great that you can actually hear her, the author read her own work in that way. Yeah, and, 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 and there's a word that stuck with me there when you, when you, just when you said it, like you had me at embodiment, you know, because I think that's one of the big themes of, of this work is um, embody, what does it mean to embody, embody religion? You know, there's a lot of... Um, scenes where like um you know it's not right um sac- sacrilegious right um and what does it mean also to embody a poem right like that's one of the the, the one of my favorite poems that, you know we can talk about it later in more detail um but so w- w- what did you think about like w- what is it that you, you like about the book the most in terms of the some of the things we've talked about like identity or you know the, the, the struggle with like her, her mom when it comes to mm-hmm. her religious upbringing um, uh, you know we haven't talked much about Aman also well I really I related to the book in the sense in the sense that she did question her religion because I was raised in a household where my mother is Christian mm-hmm. but my father and his entire family are Catholic mm-hmm. so I did mm-hmm. go to all of the confirmation the first communions I did all of those things but at the same time, I was like, 
here I am praying to saints and virgins, Mm -hmm. where on the other hand, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, that made me question it a lot. So I related to her questioning her religion and how she was being forced to go to um, confirmation classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting how she explores that in in that private space too, you know, that um, it's it kind of goes to like the need like uh, the, or the power that writing has on even if it's not poetry right even if it's just prose like in the other wallpaper the power that it has and just the, the ther- therapeutic power but also the power of like self-reflection yeah. and I think just real quickly from a teaching perspective I think that's something that I think is underrated when it comes to teaching and the kinds of things we want to instill in our students is, you know, yeah, like, you know, they, they write, you write essays, you write, you know, she, uh, Sumara, um, prominently showcases like first drafts and final drafts of work, you yeah. know, that I think from a teaching perspective, right? Like you can see that the big differences, mm-hmm. uh, in, in the revising, um, and it's kind of an, a, a backstage look, right, at, like, how did something look before it was actually submitted? Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, this power of self-reflection, it comes from her writing about her deepest thoughts that we ourselves now are privy to. I think uh, there's something that um, makes this all the more powerful because of that. It, you know, it's, it's kind of like confessional poetry in a way, although that has its own associations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I definitely that resonated with me as well. I, I actually love how in in this in this format in itself, you have her kind of sharing her drafts of her work as well, including um, at, at some points her her teacher's notes and comments as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and that's a, a great way to tell a story, you know. But definitely seeing how how even in, in her process she kind of starts one way. And it's been going somewhere else, which you know, in a way, is it's a story in itself. You know, the story she wants to tell versus the one she ends up telling. Mm-hmm. You know, especially this first draft of, 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 of getting her her notebook from her brother, which not to like go right into the emotional components of it, because I think once we dive a little deeper in, in future episodes, we can do that. But like, there's little moments too where like I kind of get a little tear in my eye, like those little things of her brother getting her a notebook because he sees that's the way how she's kind of negotiating her her feelings. You know, where I don't think she's too great at expressing it regularly, you know, and early on. So yeah. I appreciate seeing those those those, those transitions and, and that uh, natural evolution. Yeah. What did you think, Vanessa, of like the relationship between her and, and twin as, you know, she's referred to? Twin. I, I really liked their relationship. They obviously knew one another very well and they kind of bounced off of one another. Um, they, she had like a, she called it like her twin, what was it? Her twin or something like that. Hmm. She used like a specific, like, like kind of like. Yeah. Like she mixed two words. I can't remember uh, what they A little, a little portmanteau. Mm. It was like her twin tuition or something twin like tuition, that. Twin tuition. That's great. Great yeah. <laughs> and So she like could feel when he was upset. Mm. Yeah. I mean, um. You know, uh, th- there's one of those poems, right, where she does talk about how, um, you know, they, they, they shared the womb together. And because of that, they kind of have this um, this mind melt, right, like in Pacific Rim or something. Um, and um, he himself has a very interesting arc, too. Um, and... and so I, I I think Elizabeth did an amazing job of of um, you know not having not having like stock characters you know like the, the father is in stock character like they're all fleshed out yeah um, like I mean they kind of begin as as like, like tropes of mm-hmm. this kind of not like you know the the, yeah. the, the present absent father but yeah the, she definitely through through the verse gives them more complexity of. And, and brings them out, as you said, fleshes them out yeah. to like characters that you can you can see, imagine, and even like see walking down the sidewalk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another um, big um, motif in the work is is music. 
And so maybe you two can speak more to that because I myself, you know, I'm more of a rock guy, but, um, you know, th th there's a lot of allusions to music and um, it it's initially, of course, like a big, uh, um, a, a major way that um, she's able to connect with someone, right? And so this idea of music is connection to is very important. But what did you all think about some of those allusions, like how, how she uses them and, and their role? I really enjoyed that because it kind of puts you in a time frame of when this is happening. Mm. Um, she's listening to a new Nicki Minaj album. She listens to Drake, J. Cole, Kendrick. Mm -hmm. She's kind of able to get ideas for her writing and her, I guess, performance style from these artists mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, and, and um, <clears throat> to kind of just expound on, on how it ties in overall, like, as at a young age, this is her, her first understanding how how language, right, and particularly through music lyrics, can connect you with a total stranger, mm. which is, is such a powerful antidote to um, isolation, feelings of isolation. You know, she's going through, through some changes, and it, some of it's harsh, and um, being able to to uh, to resonate with lyrics when her when her teacher shows the the poem for the first time in class and and she kind of she has these feelings like whoa oh be still my my beating heart right and she, she uses great image for that but like you know it's through those those song lyrics early on I think she mentions that in, in the, the, that poem Asylum mm -hmm. just just at like near the end of the first part yeah right where she realizes at a young age. How, how that can connect. And of course, this translates into later on writing, you know, um, her writing in notebooks kind of as a response to the world around her. And she's not able to communicate, but she can write it down. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you, you highlight that. I mean, again, we'll talk more. I, I really want to dig into the text. It, it's, it, it, it's totally hard not to. And I'm trying not to. That, that's, that's why I, I had the book like closed away. But I'm like, yeah. no, I have to see this line really quick. We're, we're all English majors here uh, to the listeners and so you can kind of, you know, but, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's probably one of my favorite poems, top three for sure. And, and the work and, um, of course I also really like her prose and I, you know, I think it's, it's important not like to kind of think about the, the, the mixture of, of genres, right? No, novel, verse, mm -hmm. um, prose, um, you know, the, 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 the confessions, right? And also there's that kind of double meaning of a confession because of the role of religion here mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's such an interesting confluence and in, in, in tying up of, of themes, right? Because even, even in like that religious aspect, you know, you there's so many times where um, verse means this and this, right? Mm -hmm. Like when she's when she first hears that poet, she goes home and she like she starts to try practicing, uh, hearing her words out loud. And her mom's like, "What are you doing?" And she, and of course, she wants to think mm -hmm. she's studying Bible verse. But yeah. you know, there's there's uh, several instances throughout where you kind of see these these like things kind of intertwined mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, the the, the the dramatic irony there, I I I I really like too, and the subversiveness of it right that like you know she has to do it behind her back uh not just yeah. the, the writing but also the time with Amon too right like there's this whole but, uh, secret uh, life that she's kind yeah. of living yeah yeah and, and, and kind of um her um noting like the rules for dating and all that um <laughs> That was, which is kind of like, if you, like, it's, it's kind of like in, in, in Latina culture, it's kind of like a cliche thing, like, uh, almost like where it's comedic, but not, it's kind of also, it's too close to home for so many people. Mm -hmm. Like, no yeah. dating until like, after you're married. You know? like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously I'm exaggerating, but, you know, it's essentially something like that, right? And so. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um... What about allusions to um, uh, television? We were talking about this a little bit before we started. Yeah, so in one of the poems, she's with her best friend, Caridad, and they're kind of, she's braiding her hair. And she asks her, do you want me to do it the way Cardi B does her braids? And so her friend Caridad is like, yes, let me put on some episodes of Love and Hip Hop. And so they start watching that. And so that kind of, Ties in again to the time period. 
and what's happening. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the culture too, right? Cause you mentioned the, the, the braiding and, um, you know, there's a lot that I learned about Dominican culture and, um, uh, Elizabeth herself, according to writer read online, you know, she identifies as Afro Latina, you know, so even her own, the, the culture itself is, you know, there, one of the parts in the, one of the poems in the first part that drew my attention when it came to that is, um, do you guys remember the, the one about the Sancocho? Um, yeah. Yeah, like the stew, right? That, you know, and, and again, this goes back to something Richie said about her use of metaphors and how, um, you know, effective she is at it. I, I think that's, that's, um, definitely something that um speaks to her power as as a poet Mm -hmm. um and because you know again speaking as as a very very amateur um you know hack poet you could say like i thought that come on don't do that yourself (laughs) (laughs) Uh, well you know it's um it's um I don't know, but um, self-deprecation, you know. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, It's very hard, you know, because, like, there's a lot of trite image, like, trite comparisons, and it's got to fit in perfectly. But I think it really showcases the voice. And in a nutshell, Mm -hmm. I think this is what this poem is about. Like, uh, almost literally, this is about Xiomara finding her voice as a writer, as a... As, as a woman, right, as a girl. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, um, I think early on, one of the first things that, that really hit me, uh, like I said, I think her her imagery packs a punch. It's something that, that knocks you back with, with like, it, it's it's potency. And, um, and, and again, it's the ability to kind of intertwine these, these, these elements of her finding her own voice, but also, like you mentioned, kind of Acevedo her, herself, kind of uh, her identity as an Afro-Latino poet. One of the lines she uses early on, one of the first lines that, that really, uh, that just remembers, I remember, you know, that I, I, I kind of, this book takes me for a loop is, I think, you know, she's struggling with, with this kind of silence. I think she, she uses a line like, a mouth that is silent, but sharpening itself like a machete. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like, like an, from the island. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's this whole idea of like, that's brewing already, mm-hmm. you know, her, 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 her soul not, trying yeah. to like get out in that way, right? Like you use this, this this imagery of like the, the tongue, the words. She's sharpening it. It's not yeah. ready yet. She said, "As sharp as an island machete." I think she says, "Yeah." I'm like man, that's yeah. It's All right, very, it's very visceral, right? Mm-hmm. Like her, her very very um, barbed in in how she's able to um, describe what she's going through, right? So yes, I think you do really. Like even us, us two guys here, like we can connect with that, right? And that's when you know that, you know, um, uh, then uh, that's one of the, the the telltale signs to me of like a writer's talent. Mm-hmm. You know, being able to um, connect with a, a variety of different readers. Yeah. I I did watch an interview of Elizabeth, and she mentions that some of these poems actually came from her journal when she was mm. around mm. Siomara's age. Mm. So she kind of described it as a collaboration with her younger <laughs> self. <laughs> and I yeah. thought it was the coolest thing. Yeah. That is really dope. Man. Yeah, that, that blows my mind. Just kind of the idea of going back to your younger self, right? Because, yeah. of course, you're, you're no longer the same person. And, yeah. Mm. Yeah, you never step into the same river twice. We definitely remember <laughs> yeah. the current. Yeah. Wow, really cool. What are what are some other aspects, like overall themes that, that really struck a chord with you, Vanessa? Well, for me, it was really the relationships that she has with all of her friends and her family and even her teacher, Ms. Galeano, and even with Aman, the way that she kind of carries herself when she's around him, she... Let's herself be more vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think again, speaking to the strength of the writer, I think I think these little things, like like when you touch a forearm accidentally, and you like, like I'm like I the told, I, I remember that, you know. Yeah, I think many of us can probably relate to those little things, and I think that that just speaks to like 
a beautiful way in which uh, Acevedo, and, and again, in relation to what the book's saying here, how words can connect people, you know, like, I, wow, yes, I know this part, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, the relationships, you kind of spoke a little bit about the that religious aspect, right? And, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to exploring like how, how, how you can relate to those themes a little, a little later on as well. Yeah. Yeah, and so I'm looking forward to these next few episodes we were, where we will dive in deeper into this book and kind of discuss different poems from it and kind of elaborate more on how relevant the book is. Um, and also, uh, I feel like you have uh, future aspirational designs uh, for this podcast. Do you plan on ending with Poet X? No, um, I want to do a different book each month. So next month we are looking into doing Black Klansmen. Mm. Yeah, and then um, maybe the month after, after that, um, which should be in no- November, um, Hit You Give. And, you know, both of those we can compare w- with, the, mm-hmm. with, with the adaptation. And um, we're very excited to be hosting... Um, Ron Stallworth, who, you know, is the man behind uh, Blank Klansman. And uh, we're trying to see if maybe we can actually bring him in for an interview. Um, and we are going to be interviewing him regardless, you know, in the, yeah. um, in the in what we call our literary fiesta that we host right here. Mm-hmm. And I, I think also we want to bring in like a border perspective to some of these things. And you kind of hinted at that, Vanessa, that like what makes it relevant. Um um, so, so yeah, um, you got, you all can stay tuned about that. And, and we'll also have, you know, some special guests, um, who, you know, like I mentioned, Ron Stallworth, uh, so things like that. And, um, you know, we really want to thank the, the Mountain Foundation for, um, giving us this opportunity and yeah. do this project. And, you know, we have other projects going on, uh, that we want to showcase what is it about, uh, this border community, right, that uh, is literary and, yeah. you know, we're just three, but there's a lot of it that we can get into, <laughs> but that's <clears throat> that's another another thing. Yes, yeah, so all the can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> but with every podcast, if you guys are listening, that's cool. Yeah. Like, subscribe, yes, follow. Please. And we'll try to have some, sp- throw in some Spanish too, you know, we are in the border. Um, <laughs> literalmente, literal. Uh, it's a lot easier for me to say. Nice, uh, I think that. Yeah. Dig it. Cool. So thanks for listening, guys. Till next episode, we're going to deep dive deeper into poetics of Poet X. <laughs>